Hello, history friends! So the Verdi Museum is currently closed. In lieu of a brick-and-mortar museum, over the next few weeks we will be embarking upon a virtual museum experience, a magical history tour, if you will, hosted by me, a very serious lady in a very serious jacket, and an assortment of carefully curated stuff that I found in the museum basement and that was small enough to fit in the trunk of my car. Let's get historical! Today our object is this, a glass bottle of burdock blood bitters circa 1948. At the moment, disease and contagion are on everyone's minds. Also, their faces, hands, and lungs. So we thought our first artifact would be medical. Burdock blood bitters was a patent medicine. Now, normally when we hear the word patent, we think it means something that has been approved by a qualified professional. Somebody who knows something has looked at this thing and approved it for sale to the general public. In the case of this bottle, that could not be further from the truth. The word patent in patent medicines actually goes all the way back to royal patent. Let's say it's the 17th century. You've mashed some roots and leaves together and you've discovered that the resulting squeezings balance out your black bile with your yellow bile, which is very important. You can then take your root squeezings to the king or other local crown-wearing person. If the crown-wearing person approves of your root squeezings, you get what is called a letter patent or royal patent, meaning you can use the royal name and or coat of arms in your advertising from then on. This would be a big boost to your brand because, as we all know, no one who wears a crown has ever been wrong about anything. Ever. The word patent trickled down through the centuries until by Fernie times, approximately the late 1890s, all it really meant was that the name and ingredients had been trademarked, so that no one could take the fake and misleading name that you had made up for your fake medicine and apply it to their fake medicine, because that would be wrong. So what is actually in this? Well, a lot of patent medicines contain opium, morphine, strychnine, mercury, cocaine, or just copious amounts of alcohol. But in the 19th century, that wasn't in itself really the problem. After all, this was an era in which doctors and pharmacists prescribed their patients those kinds of things all the time. The problem with patent medicines was that nobody knew exactly how much, if anything, of those ingredients was actually in it, and what it would actually do. Patent medicine ingredients, like these ones, were kept completely secret, which meant that you could put pretty much anything in there, or nothing. Some amounted to basically colored and flavored water, with maybe a dash of glycerin or ginger mixed in. If they did contain active ingredients, a lot of the time it was really just laxatives or diuretics. A note on the wording, a laxative is something that makes you poop, a diuretic is something that makes you pee. For example, burdock bitters contain not only burdock root, but also dandelion, seneca, cascara bark, yellow dock, and various other well-known herbs, roots, and barks, any of which could also have been diuretics or laxatives. Why laxatives? Well, and this is about to get a little gross, the Edwardians and Victorians were obsessed with pooping, and they believed that regular movements of the bowels were an absolute necessity to the health of all systems of the body, not just the digestive. Also, the nice thing about laxatives is that they're not known for their subtle effects. If you're selling a fake medicine that at least has laxatives in it, well, at least you know when something is happening. So what were patent medicines prescribed for? Patent medicines claimed to cure pretty much everything that they could get away with, and for most of the 19th century that meant, well, everything. The label for burdock bitters, for example, claims to cure dyspepsia, sour stomach, constipation, biliousness, headaches, and minor liver and kidney complaints, which is a lot of vague and somewhat unrelated stuff. But in other advertising, it's also claimed to cure eczema, boils, depression, dizziness, insomnia, watery blood, and scrofula, which is a form of tuberculosis and is definitely not going to be cured by a dose of dandelion root. The T. Milburn Company, which manufactured burdock blood bitters along with many other patent medicines, advertised constantly. It even published its own BBB almanac, published from the 1870s to around 1931. Like most almanacs, the BBB was a charmingly folksy, easy-to-read book full of jokes, proverbs, astrological charts, weather predictions, and pages and pages and pages of testimonials from grateful patients attesting to their miraculous cures. The T. Mulburn Company also published trading cards, which, 
While mostly focusing on pretty ladies and unnervingly serious babies, sometimes verged on Hieronymus Bosch level weird. For example, this NRA Chihuahua, or this small child emerging from an old man's face like something out of Ridley Scott's Alien. Patent medicines like this one were ridiculously popular all the way through the 19th and early 20th centuries because you didn't need a qualified doctor or pharmacist to get them, and you could buy them pretty much anywhere, at any general store. You could also get them door to door and through the mail, which was very handy if you happened to live in, say, a small town in the southeast corner of British Columbia. In 1908, doctors and pharmacists finally pressured the Canadian government to pass the Proprietary and Patent Medicines Act, which made it illegal to sell any medicine without listing the ingredients on the bottle or box it came in. And if we look right here, we can see that Burdock Blood Bitters is number 5811 under the Proprietary or Patent Medicines Act. The PPMA wasn't perfect, but it was the first time that a lot of these patent medicine companies had ever been regulated in the first place. And once people actually started to see what was inside of their magical potions and tonics and salves, sales started to drop. But they never completely disappeared. Nowadays, this kind of thing is more regulated, but there are still plenty of burdock blood bitters-like substances lurking in the natural medicine section of your grocery store or health food store. To me, this is an ancient bottle of alcoholic compost juice, but to an unscrupulous peddler of snake oil, and believe me, there are plenty of them out there, this is a natural herbal detox tonic, and they'll sell it to you for $40. Buyer beware. So that is the sordid tale of burdock blood bitters. Thank you so much for tuning in, and please come back next week when we uncover the secrets behind a soldier's helmet from World War II.